Perhaps you've seen clips of Dark and Darker from huge variety streamers, and while they personally stopped playing it, it caught your eye and has been something you've been interested in for a while, or maybe there's some other way you learned about this game and want to get into it. Either way, here I hope to give you a good starting foundation in how to get started and get you involved in the Dark and Darker game and community. The very first thing you'll need to do after buying and installing the game is creating a character. There are currently 8 classes right now in the game, with the ninth announced to be coming soon. TM. I don't worry too much about the characters you create, you have currently 8 character slots meaning you can have a character for every class or if you'd prefer, multiple characters of the same class if you're not interested in playing all of the classes in the game. You can also delete your characters freely so don't worry about it. Each class has its own special skills, perks, baseline stats and weapon arsenals, however most weapons in the game are shared between a few classes. At the very beginning, I would just recommend to try what class fantasy appeals to you the most. But some classes are more difficult to get into and start playing with than others, and these difficulties are not always the most obvious. For example, the Rogue, while is currently decent at killing players of similar gear levels and loots chests and moves very fast, their weapons are mostly quite low range outside of the Rapier, which means a newer player will probably struggle more with PvE monsters than a fresh player starting as a fighter, for example. But, as I said, don't worry too much about these as a new player has given time, patience and some effort, you'll be able to learn and play with any class. If you don't really care what class you start as, I'd recommend to either start as the Fighter or Cleric if you'd also want to learn the basics of spellcasting. Now, by default you will only be able to play as a human unless you bought the Hold the Lion version of the game which is a little bit more expensive in which case you'll also have the exclusive Skeleton Race. Now, is the game pay to win? Definitely not as you can easily acquire a race almost exactly the same as the skeleton, the elite skeleton, complete for free which is arguably just better than the normal skeleton. And there are a few other races that offer minor stat changes and the more experimental race, the Lizardmen, who have a unique mechanic all available for in-game currency. These are mostly just useful for slight min-maxes rather than huge advantages. So there's a few things to note before you get into your first game. First you'll want to head over to class and perk and skill, and choose whichever perk you want and whichever skills you want to use. The balancing on these isn't amazing, and some are better than others, but I won't be covering that in this video as it changes relatively frequently with balance updates, but do let me know in the comments if you'd like to see things like this. Also, if you're a spellcasting class, head over to spells and just take a look at which spells you can bring. But be aware that you cannot bring every top tier spell as spells require memory capacity. Your memory capacity is displayed here at the bottom, you can go over the memory capacity maximum, however you will not be able to use the spells in-game unless you find sufficient extra memory capacity. Another thing to note for spellcasters is that in order for you to be able to cast spells, you need to bring a spell memory skill, as this is how you select your spells to use. Once you've decided on that, head over to the stash and take a peek on the left side. This will display your perk and skill loadout, along with the items currently on your character. If you die in the dungeon, you will lose every single item on your character. There is no way to save items like the containers in Tarkov, you will lose everything. However, every time you die and exit the match, you will return to this gear, as this is your base kit. So don't worry too much about not dying in the beginning, you'll die a lot and it's part of the learning experience. At the time of recording, there are three maps with a rotation of solos, duos and trios. This means if you're only playing solo as time progresses, you'll have to play different maps. Unfortunately for new players, this will make the game harder to learn. There are also two different game modes, Normal and High Roller. Previously, High Roller required you to be level 15 and pay gold every time to enter. However, currently there are no requirements for heading into High Roller. There are, however, requirements for entering the Normal games, as you can only enter Normal games if your entire inventory is white tier or lower. As a new player, I would suggest going into normal for a while and learning the basic attack patterns of most of the monsters in the game and trying to get some map knowledge. However, Crypts and Goblin games also have multiple different layouts with different mob setups, trap layouts, and just a few differences as a whole. High Roller has much better loot than normal games, but the players are going to be more experienced, on average will have more gear than the players in normal games, and elite enemies, generally red tinted enemies, are much more common, which have higher health pools, faster attacks, and sometimes different attack patterns, which will be even harder for a newer player to learn. After this knowledge, you should be ready for your first few games. For this, you will probably want to know some basic information on the basics of combat. So, at first, the animations for this game probably feel a bit slow and clunky, and I guess they are, but what this means is that speed is one of the most important stats in this game. 
whether it's for clearing rooms, kiting, looting, or spacing enemies in melee combat. Now this guide isn't going to be for a specific class, there will be some differences between classes, but these general principles still apply in most situations. Even as wizard, warlock and ranger, you will still have to use melee to clear mobs sometimes, so it's an important skill to learn for all classes. Most notably, when you are moving backwards, you take a pretty major movement speed penalty, which doesn't apply when moving forwards or to the side, which is why you see experienced players generally turning away and strafing to the side rather than running backwards. You can easily practice this on mobs and eventually try to implement it in fighting players. Another thing to note is that there are different damage multipliers based on where you hit. A headshot gives 150% damage, meaning 50% bonus damage. Meanwhile, the body shot would be 100%, no penalty or bonus. Arms give 80%, legs 60%, and feet or hands both give 50% multipliers. This applies to melee combat, thrown weapons, physical projectiles, and also projectile spells such as fireball and magic missile. There is also another similar mechanic which involves sweet spots on the weapons. For some weapons, this is pretty obvious. If you hit an enemy with a spiked part of the Morning Star, it will do more damage than the wooden handle part. These can be pretty extreme, up to a 40% damage multiplier, meaning you're losing 60% of your damage if you're hitting with the hilt. This differs from weapon to weapon, so I can't go over them all, but there are guides on the wiki or other in-depth videos about it. But generally, these are pretty logical, and you're going to do the most damage with the final half of your sword, or the sharp part of your axe, etc. Of course, you can also block with shields or certain two-handed weapons, or the flute if you're a bard, and this is quite a powerful skill and doesn't feel like you'd probably expect it to. The hitbox of your shield, of course, changes with which shield or blocking weapon you have equipped, and this is generally smaller than what I think new players would expect. This means to actually block attacks, you need to aim your shield at the part of the weapon that will actually hit you. Sometimes you'll have to turn a bit further than you would normally expect, especially for certain mobs such as the Skeleton Axeman. And just because your shield is up, you can still get clipped in, you know, the legs, the arms, the head, if that weapon does go past it or around it. One more thing to note about combat is every item you have equipped may come with a movement speed penalty. Boots generally have a movement speed bonus, but almost every other item except jewellery and certain exceptions will slow you down. But this will only apply if the item is equipped and, in the case of a weapon, actually in your hands as your active weapon slot. This means, like in some similar games, if you unequip your weapon and run with your hands out, for which the default keybind is X, you will not receive the movement speed penalty of either of your weapon slots. Very handy if you need to kite or run as fast as you can away from a mob. This also brings us to the basics of spellcasting. Just a quick note, Bard works pretty similarly to spellcasting, but is much more complicated and I won't be covering it in this video. So as I said, you need a spell memory skill which you will hold to open up the spell selection wheel and you need a magic item in order to cast spells. This includes the spell book, magic staff, crystal ball, and crystal sword. You then cast the spell by holding right click and releasing right click when you want to send it. If you want to cancel the spell, then you can either stop holding right click before this cast completes and the bar at the bottom is full, or you can press F during the cast or when the spell is ready to send. We won't be going into the exact details of the spells in this video, that could be another one. But a thing to note about buff spells and heal spells is that these can target enemies as well as allies. So if you try to heal your enemy who is in a melee fight with another enemy, player or monster, if you miss, you might heal the enemy. This also goes for buff spells and also bodies on the floor can eat buffs and heals if you're not too careful. So try not to look at the ground whilst casting spells if you want to buff yourself. However, this can have some useful interactions sometimes, such as with chain lightning. Wizards and clerics regain spells either through normal resting, default key binding is G, resting at campfires which give them back much faster than normal resting, or specifically the wizard has a skill to meditate and regain them back quite quickly on a relatively short cooldown, the meditation. The warlock is unique and instead uses health to cast spells with no cooldown or spell limit, the only limit being death from using too much of your own health pool. So now you're probably good enough to take out a few mobs, and it's time to get some well-earned loot. Mobs have loot on their bodies, but it's usually pretty low-tier items. But they also drop quest items, and these are specific to what kind of mob you kill. And while they are used in quests, they also have some other uses such as crafting, so even if you've completed all the quests, they're still usually worth picking up, either to craft with or to trade with other players. Some classes have really low interaction speeds, such as the Cleric and Wizard, but they're usually balanced around being able to destroy barrels and crates. Meanwhile, the faster looting classes generally have worse ways to destroy these, 
but they loot chests and objects that you need to interact with much faster, such as the Ranger and Rogue. As of a recent-ish change, items higher quality than white now sold for a good amount to vendors. This scales both with slots that the item takes up and also the rarity of the item. They're still worse than the little trinkets and gems that you pick up of similar rarity, but it's usually easier to find higher rarity items than higher rarity trinkets, so quite often you'll be filling most of your inventory with equip equipable items and then take a few smaller trinkets to fill the gaps along with other meds and things you might want to bring out with you. The more geared you are, you'll probably be bringing in more meds, throwable weapons, campfires and ammunition if you're a class with access to ranged weapons, and these will of course eat up some of your inventory spots, especially for rangers when you're usually bringing in multiple stacks of arrows. So there is a balance in all of these, and dropping meds if you find something especially valuable is quite viable. Generally, you find the most usable items from destroying barrels and boxes, from higher tier mobs such as the Skeleton Champion and the Wraith, or occasionally from chests. Sellables usually come from chests and pots, but also can be found in barrels and boxes too, and there are also plenty of loot spawns on tables, shelves, and hidden among the floor or walls. Quite often you'll find high tier chests being locked, which can only currently be opened by rogues with a lockpicking mastery perk, or anyone with a lockpick consumable. These are quite valuable as the lock chests are generally very high tier chests, such as the lion's head chests or golden chests, and usually contain high tier items and very good sellables, so if you find some lockpicks, probably save these in your stash until you figure out where the lock chests most commonly are. You will also have to pass one or two skill checks where a minigame comes up on your screen and you'll have to press spacebar during the correct area. The red area is actually good and instantly opens the chests fully, so don't worry about hitting it thinking it's bad like I did when I first used my first lockpicks. The last thing we'll talk about in this guide are just some small tips about vendors. The first thing to note is you can sell all sellables to the collector, and aside from that any items to any vendor. You don't need to sell weapons to the weaponsmith etc. Thankfully, it's not like Tarkov, and all vendors buy items for the same price. While the vendors usually at the beginning only sell white and grey items, they are very useful for selling medical supplies and consumables. For example, potions from the alchemist, bandages from the surgeon, arrows, bolts, campfires, throwing axes, etc. from the woodsman. These meds are pretty cheap, so I usually recommend buying three grey health potions and three grey bandages for every one or at least runs where you have a little bit of gear for already, not base kit runs. As these will help you to live a lot more, and only cost about 30 gold for all of these meds which you can easily make. Make sure to buy the grey meds, the price increase for the white ones is just not worth it for how little they actually improve. As you complete quests for the vendors, they will unlock more items in the shops and more crafts. These quests are on their first iteration currently and are quite long and grindy, but hopefully this will be turned down a bit in the future. These quests also have to be completed by every character on your account, so if you're like me and play a lot of different classes, you have to play a ton to get any real progress through them. There are also event items that somewhat commonly drop. Currently, during the winter event, we have an extra trader called Nicholas, and some extra items that drop somewhat rarely, called Candy Canes and Gingerbread Men. These are worth huge amounts of money to players in the trading post, as these trade for generally high tier items from either Nicholas or the Goblin Merchant. The Goblin Merchant is the fastest way of gambling in Dark and Darker, and will offer you many items of random rarities for generally high prices. Usually the house, or the Goblin Merchant in this case, will come out ahead and sell you some terrible white item for 100 gold, which is a complete scam. But sometimes you might get lucky and then get something up to legendary with about a 0.25% chance by the look of people's data on the wiki. I hope this information is valuable for a new player and I think these basic tips should help you to start out in the dungeons. There's plenty more information to this game as this game is actually quite deep, especially in the way things play out with the stats and the playstyle differences between the classes. I thank you for watching this far through, and if you're looking to buy Dark and Darker, the 30% off sale for it just got extended by two weeks until the 18th of January. So if you want to buy it, or have any friends or family who might be interested, now is a pretty good time. If you liked the video, likes would be appreciated. If you'd like to see more like this or my other videos, which are generally longer form playthroughs of different classes, starting from zero and snowballing into some higher tier gear and earning gold, I'd recommend subscribing. It helps me out and I might have more content that you might be interested in. Thank you very much for watching, I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you guys, bye bye.